I'm here with uh, Michael Brook, a film critic and historian, and we are in Sokolovsko on the 26th of August 2023. Hello, Michael. Hello, Michal. It's very uh, nice to see you. It's um, very nice to uh, see you actually here uh, uh, in a place that's rich in uh, Krzysztof Kieślowski's legacy and history. We are a few feet away from Krzysztof Kieślowski archive, which uh, holds Krzysztof Kieślowski papers and a number of materials related to uh, Kieślowski's life and work. And we meet today during the 12th um, homage a Kieślowski film festival to discuss one of the most famous uh, Krzysztof Kieślowski films, Camera Buff, Amator, from 1979. Um, as we were preparing for this, we also studied some materials from the Krzysztof Kieślowski archive. Uh, Michael, from what I understand, this is the first Krzysztof Kieślowski you ever saw. Is that right? It's it's not. That's not quite right. No, the um, the it's, but it is the first Kieślowski film that was released in Britain. It was the first Kieślowski film that anyone wrote about in the English language. His films have been exclusively Polish up to then. For me, I think it was the short film about killing was my first, and then short film about love, Decalogue, and either, I think I saw Devil Life of Veronique and Camera Buff in the same week in Paris, which meant that I had to watch Camera Buff with French subtitles. Now, my French is pretty good, but not fluent. So it was, it's been very interesting watching the film over the decades, because every single time, I started from this point of view where I was worrying more about translating the dialogue than paying attention to the background details and then the more I knew about Polish culture the more I knew of, of which I was totally ignorant back then the more I knew about Polish cinema um, for example when I finally saw Krzysztof Zanussi's Camouflage I realized why that particular film was being quoted um, I mean just lots of other little details and it's because it's just become a richer and richer and richer film and when you and I watched it again yesterday which must have been about my probably about my fifth time um, there were tons of details that I was spotting even before you brought them up that I simply hadn't noticed before um, it was certainly a joy to uh, re-watch this film yesterday uh, with you and also discover a lot of connections that I often missed even though I thought that I knew this film well but apparently it really opens itself up with fresh readings and possibilities every single time. It's a very richly textured work, even though it's uh, shot in a way that seems very casual on the first viewing, but it is it is a rich, rich work with uh, many, many uh, contexts. Um, the story of Philip, uh, Philip Mosch, who um, buys uh, a film camera to film his daughter, um, a newborn, and to really document the kind of family life that he always dreamt of having also as an orphan. Um, the story is deceptively simple. Uh, Philip begins to be pulled into uh, industrial filmmaking on the uh, order from uh, the director of a factory that he works in. And every step of the way, he discovers just what a complex act filmmaking is. It's not an act that's separated from from society, from politics, from economics, it is in fact an act that is deeply complex, that it's being censored, it's being shaped by the expectations and uh, limitations by of uh, of the world that uh, Philip inhabits. Uh, what do you find particularly interesting about this story, this film, at this particular moment in Krzysztof Kieślowski's career, 1979? Well, it's something I obviously wouldn't have appreciated on the first viewing, but, but do much more now, is that it was made 10 years into his professional career, uh, virtually all of which had been spent making short documentaries. And the film, he started writing the script in 1977, which is, he'd had a few ethical crises over his career. One the first one I think it was in well first of all I think the first time he experienced censorship was when he made a, a documentary in collaboration with other Polish filmmakers of his generation called Workers 71 um, 
which was heavily censored and broadcast on television in a version I think was cut by about half its length. Um, then in 1974, he made a film called First Love, which was a study of a young, a very young couple expecting their first child, and it goes up to the point of the, the birth of their daughter. And he, intend, he originally intended to carry on filming the daughter because he thought it would be really fascinating, just as Philip in the film thinks it would be really fascinating, to chart the growth of a, a, a human being. Um, the only problem being the the, the the girl would not be able to give informed consent for a very long time. Uh, it's unlikely Polish television would have wanted to wait that long. And Kishlovsky just, he basically said, do I have the right to do this? Even if the parents give me permission, do I have the moral right to, to um, you know, basically force this this girl into into becoming, it's almost like, almost like the, the star of the Truman Show many, <laughs> a couple of decades later. And he ultimately decided that, no, I don't have that right. And he abandoned the project. And then in 1977, the year when he, first wrote Camera Buff, he made two films back to back, um, I Don't Know, and from a, light, a night porter's point of view, both of which were portraits of fairly controversial figures. One was a essentially a whistleblower who um, was uncovering corruption at a fairly high level of government. And Kishlovsky filmed his, essentially his confession, and then thought, I can't use this because if this film is shown in public, this guy could get into really serious trouble. And in fact, for many decades, it was the hardest Kishlovsky film to see. It's only very recently been made available. And I, I suspect the, the, the subject of the film, I don't know this, but I suspect the subject of the film is now dead. Um, and from a night porter's point of view, which is one of Kishlovsky's most famous documentaries, is about a night porter who has basically extreme right-wing, borderline fascist political views. Um, the night porter was apparently absolutely delighted with the film, thought it was an extremely fair portrait of him. Um, but Kishlovsky again was worried that there might be personal repercussions for him, even though he clearly didn't like the night porter very much. He didn't think he, he had the right to engineer a situation where he could really get into trouble and I can see how all these situations fed their way into camera buff with people being worried about consequences at a very early stage the boss says can you take out the guy with the glasses from some sort of rather clandestine filming that Philip has been doing behind the scenes of the the works jubilee um, and it's quite clear that the guy with the glasses is is not supposed to be captured on film we're not we're not told why but clearly something is going on behind the scenes that Philip is not supposed to know about and of course, the whole definition of investigative journalism is you're trying to find out things that people, someone somewhere does not want you to know about. And uh, Philip, um, almost unwittingly, is sort of blundering into that world and doesn't really know how to handle it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, it's very important to keep uh, this chronology in mind, the, the chronology that you just uh, drew our attention to, because uh, Amator, even though it's a feature film, a scripted fictional story, definitely has an air about it um, of a personal reckoning with some moral issues that uh, Kishlovsky was uh, experiencing at this time and in a quite profound, painful way. It's it's definitely uh, a filmmaker's inquiry of himself, in a way. Kishlovsky is asking himself the questions uh, as a documentary filmmaker, how far am I uh, allowed to go? What is my relationship to the filmed subject? And perhaps most importantly, what is the uh, afterlife of a film after it's being released, after it's being sort of released, uh, thrown upon the public? And what happens then? Uh, what what happens to the subject of the film? What happens to the people that I portray? Uh, are they embraced? Are they criticized? Are they brutally chastised? Uh, it, it's very, very much on his mind. And that's why I think one of the pivotal late moments in the film is the scene in which Philip actually prevents one of his films from being shown on television. Because the film is done. We can assume that it's a good film, that, you know, Vitek, the collaborator of Philip, is very happy with the film. He feels that it, this is the, their strongest work so far, and yet Philip decides not to release it because he knows that the repercussions, the consequences, could uh, harm the community that he uh, is part of, could harm also his boss, who, in a scene prior to this um, explain to Philip that actually the matters that he portrayed are, are more complex than he than he initially uh, thought of. So perhaps perversely I will start at the end and I will um, ask about the final scene of the film with, of Philip directing the camera upon himself. This scene has been read in many different ways. What is, what is your take? What is actually 
Philip doing in the scene and what Kishlovsky thinks he's doing. Well, halfway through the film, there is a very interesting comment made by Andrzej Jurga, who's involved with Polish television, who I think is the, a real person, um, who says, It is the duty of television to broadcast certain things. Amateurs have no such duty. You can do what you like, when you like, and how you like. That's where your strength lies. And we've already seen well before he says this, that Philip's, what, what Philip is able to film is being circumscribed by various people, not just his boss, uh, very, very early on. We, um, we've got um, the, 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 his daughter, his new, newborn daughter, Irenka, um, being changed, and, um, and Irka, his wife, said, no, no, you can't film that. Um, you know, she's a girl, you've got to protect her modesty. There's quite an interesting implication that it would have been fine if he was a boy. But the, the film is full of lots of little throwaway things like that, which will open up all sorts of other areas for discussion. But anyway, um, so when you get to the end of the film, when he turns the camera on himself, it's a kind of rueful acknowledgement that he, just as in his own face, is the one, the one thing that he can film which he has complete control over and which, um, where there is no doubt at all about the interpretation that he's intending and um, is in many ways it's a it's an omission of defeat mm. but it's it's very much in line with the kind of um anxieties that Kishlovsky himself felt and of course Kishlovsky abandoned documentary making i think the very next year yes after um, police requisitioned some of the material that he shot for his film called the Vozets, the central station uh, Kishlovsky felt that by uh, yielding this material to the to the state police uh, he is somehow um Uh, collaborating with the with the oppressive state i will just quote from an interview that kishlovsky gave in 1979 uh, he mentions that uh, the fact that philip uh, is directing the camera on himself doesn't mean he will stop making films about the outside world it means that he sees himself as part of this world he includes himself into the equation. I, I think that's that's yes, an interesting that, take. Well, actually, that's a very good point because, of course, he hasn't filmed himself up to that point. It's, it's purely been what, what he sees. And, in fact, the uh, the film that Kishlovsky made, I think the, the very next film he made after Camera Buff is Talking Heads, in which he turns the camera on a series of um, Polish people, the age range from, you know, I think a few months to a woman of 100, and just ask them the same basic questions about who they are and what they want out of life. Uh, and and the, that's all the film is, is just a parade of, of, of just close-ups of people being filmed much in much the same way that Philip was filming himself. And also a series of portraits, uh, beautiful, beautifully shot by Jacek Petrycki, the very same uh, DOP that, uh, that shot uh, Amator. And it would be uh, almost tempting to include Philip as one of those talking heads in the yes. in the film. I would say, um, what 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 for you is the most striking uh, thing about the uh, storytelling in the film? We watched the film yesterday, and we both commented that it's quite dense. That it's a very textured film. It is, and what really I mean, it's a, it's a there are several example, really model examples of, of good screenwriting practice. I mean, for example, you mentioned correctly that Philip is an orphan. This is something we don't find out about until about a third of the way into the film, with a completely throwaway dialogue exchange. It's it's a night. Um, I think Irka, his wife, is uh, distressed with something, and he comes to sort of try and calm her down. This is when they're still more or less affectionate speaking terms, and. Um, he says, I'm, I'm just going to go off to the kitchen to have some bread. And she says, I've been meaning to ask you, why do you keep eating during the night? And he said, I learned how to do it at the orphanage. And that's the first and I think only reference we, we have to him being an orphan. And the film's dialogue is full of little little details like that. Um, there's a, they also build up the appearance of characters in an interesting way. For example, we first find out about the boss when um, Philip and his friend Vitek are stealing flowers to celebrate the, uh, the the birth of his daughter. And it's, uh, it's, oh, it's, it was the boss's house, and then they sort of run away. <laughs> so, suspense scene. And then we later discover that the boss is actually a far more complex and nuanced character than than the sort of stereotypical Martinet that we'd be led to expect. Uh, yeah, and also the, 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 the character of the boss introduces some complexity to the film, but also complexity to the portrayal of Polish society of the time, because... You know, a communist state was supposedly classless. However, there is a clear class distinction between the boss, who is enjoying this small, uh, detached, semi-detached house uh, with a small orchard of his own, uh, and Philip, who lives in this, uh, you know, block blo block of flats that was just uh, built in this small, uh, small. Uh, community, uh, and it's clear that uh, that there is a clear, very big distinction in the you know level of 
wealth, let's say, and, and the living standards between those two. You've just reminded me of another throwaway line, which is um, when Andrzej Jurga, the, the sort of Polish TV guy, says, I'm, I need to go and buy a heater for my, my flat because it's really cold in the winter. And again, we presumably he lives in a major city like Warsaw or somewhere and, and in, in, a, in, a, in a flat, which is not the kind of place you would expect a sort of television executive to live in. And again, it's just a tiny little detail, but it's just, it's, it, they're just a build really, a really intricate portrait of uh, the various people. But the thing about the, the sympathetic portrait of the boss is that this is something that you also find in someone Kishlovsky's other films. Um, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of, um, well, actually, I mean, probably the most controversial one is, is Short Working Day from 1981, which is a sympathetic portrait of a, a sort of communist uh, party functionary having to deal with uh, a, a social unrest. And before that, he made um, his first theatrical feature, The Scar, which again is a similarly sympathetic portrait of a sort of middle-ranking functionary who's, again, try, he's kind of re- returning back to the uh, sort of town of his birth and he's trying to do the uh, an honest and conscientious job of rebuilding it and finds himself up against all kinds of problems. One of one of the major problems, incidentally, being caused by Jerzy Stur. It was the first time that uh, <laughs> Kishlovsky and Stur worked together. Um, so again, it's... Uh, I, th- I think Kishlovsky felt, he, and he wasn't very fond of um, either The Scar or particularly Short Working Day, because I think he thought, particularly in the atmosphere of the early 80s, he thought he'd been too sympathetic to people that he was not supposed to be sympathetic towards. But I think it, and that says something about Kishlovsky's essential humanism as a, as a, as a, as a person. He, just, he, he genuinely tries to um, see people, give fully rounded portraits of people to understand where they're coming from. Um, and um, not to caricature people. Absolutely. This is a very interesting stretch in Kishlovsky's work where uh, even some of, of his colleagues, some uh, film industry, Polish film industry members, uh, were criticizing him for that. For Especially, you know, short working day wasn't even broadcast until much, much later. But uh, for some commentators, especially ones connected uh, very closely to Solidarity Movement, those portrayals of uh, party officials in Kishlovsky's work were just a little bit too warm, uh, too sympathetic uh, for for comfort, especially in a country that uh, was just about to uh, uh, experience uh, big social movement uh, and, and that that solidarity and ultimately uh, ultimately became. Uh, so so let's keep our focus for a second on the uh, character of director or, or manager. Uh, what is your your take on him? I I was struck yesterday by just how multifaceted, possibly even inconsistent portrayal of the director we get in the film. Well, yes, I mean he's again. There's a lot of throwaway dialogue that shows that he has. Uh um, hid, hidden depths. Um, he's, in, he's into gardening. There's a, there's a wonderful bit where he's hired Philip to make a, um, a film, The Jubilee, and Philip says, I have no idea about filmmaking. I've only just bought the camera. And he says, well, you know, I, 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 no, nobody taught me about gardening. I learned it from a book. Um, there's a wonderful bit um, later on where he, he reveals that he's been taking notes with a, a pen with a light on it. <laughs> Which is the kind of the kind of I mean I mean I've I've never used one of those things as a as a working critic, but I understand it's the it's the sort of stereotypical image of what a film critic uses. So he clearly sees himself um, not just as a as a as a boss wanting to make sure that the films are doing the right job in PR terms, but also as an actual film critic. Um, and in, in fact, um, Philip's footage is constantly sort of scrutinised and interpreted and reinterpreted. Um, I mean, there's that whole thing about uh, the boss is very concerned about. When he makes the um, when he makes the documentary about his co-worker, um, the the, the um, person, the of, person, yes, um, and he says, um, "Well, I'm just really worried that you're exploiting him and you're making fun of him." And that is a it's a very it's a very humane reaction. It's a you know you can, from Philip's point of view, he's he's imposing on you know on deeply unwanted interference on his film. But in actual fact, the boss is concerned that he's not going to be held up to ridicule. Mm-hmm. And that's there's that moment where the film is shown on television. And Philip and his his colleague are actually watching it together. And the colleague gets up and goes into the the kitchen. And for a moment, we don't we don't know what his reaction is. Whether he's hor- whether he feels he's been exploited. Whether he feels that being mm-hmm. paraded on television is just too much for him. And then it turns out he absolutely loves the film and was so moved by it that he couldn't he couldn't stay there watching it. So you, you constantly get these these ambi- this ambiguity and the, the questions of interpretation and uh, um, you know what we should read into it. Which, which again, I mean, Kishlovsky would have been as a documentary filmmaker in Poland would have been more than experienced with. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I, I think that I was struck yesterday by, by just 
uh, how uh, multifaceted this portrayal is. Uh, on the uh, on the dark end, I would say uh, of this portrayal, we have the scene in which both Philip and uh, the dire- director are uh, lit by Jacek Petrycki from um, below, uh, which gives them this sort of noirish uh, look, especially the director in this complete total dark of the room uh, seems to be quite sinister as as the director uh, admonishes Philip and tells him, you know, about the requirements of, of factory filmmaking. And he seems pretty much a character out of, out of a noir, uh, a noir film. But then again, we have the scene on the hill, which I think is really crucial to the whole film and probably no actually i know it for a fact it it was problematic for some of the uh, commentators um when the director tells philip oh you don't know the whole truth you 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 do this muckraking you know investigative films you send them to television uh, you show our community is you know corrupt or inefficient or you 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 highlight this bad management but but actually you don't know that you know this supposedly bad management is often you know creative management we are redirecting state money to places that really really need them and you can see that philip is uneasy he he learns stuff that he didn't know before uh, and the director is made to look quite good he it's then that then he says that, that you know I, I keep educate myself I, I i keep reading books i keep you know trying to be up to date you should too you should also learn right the um yes i mean the the nature of the documentary that philip is making is he's, he's trying to show the contrast between the absolutely beautiful modern front fronts of the buildings and the fact that they're still pretty much falling behind behind the scenes and he thinks well this is a major journalistic scoop i'm just exposing you know sort of corruption and, and mismanagement and actually as as the as the boss says what what he's what they're doing they, they have to get the surface to look good because then they can um, possibly attract more funding to carry on you know, you know to working more on the on the fundamentals it's just real politique basically it's the kind of which i'm because Philip has no experience of this kind of world, he has um, he doesn't really understand that. And uh, I, and I think it's important to trace um, sort of the deep source of inspiration for for Philip, which actually is made quite explicit in the film uh, when Philip is leafing through a book on history of films, and he he pauses for a longer time uh, at a still from uh, Ken Loach's uh, Kess. Uh, I would say that. Even this this type of documentary filmmaking that that film Philip is at, at some point you know trying to to do has some deep roots in in British cinema in social realism in in British films from from housing problems onwards I would say oh this is absolutely true and I believe that the you know the great British documentary filmmakers of the 1930s were a big influence on the great generation of Polish documentary makers that appeared in the 1950s um, similarly Ken Loach um, has often said that two of his favorite films of all time are Milos Forman's um, A Blonde in Love and uh, Ken Loach uh, not Ken Loach Yuzhi Menzel's Closely Observed Trains uh, which he has mentioned over and over and over again as two of the films that most influenced him and, and I can, I, can, I can see what he means because they were, those films were made with a kind of freedom, working with non-professional actors, particularly in Foreman's case, um, telling you know sort of ostensibly realistic stories, things that just look like slices of life, which is very much what what Ken Loach wanted to do, is as, as a step beyond the British kitchen sink drama, which um, which we, you know was, was was much more realistic, but in, in, in that we actually got to see working class regional accents and things that again were quite rarely encountered in. British, and British films, except in, in caricature. Actually, you mentioned housing problems. What is really fascinating about housing problems, which was made in 1935, is that I think it's the very earliest synchronised sound re- record of interviews with working class British people um, who are, you know, the real thing, not not actors. Um, and, and it's really quite startling how different their voices sound from people playing working class characters in 1930s films. So you, you know, you could hear their drama school training after all that. It's fascinating. And I also, just now, I, I didn't think about it yesterday, I thought that, you know, uh, uh, British cinema of the 1960s was very present in, in Poland. It was, uh, you know, films by Tony Richardson, The Angry Young Man, uh, Lindsay Anderson, uh, were shown in Poland in 1960s, and Kieślowski was definitely familiar with with them. And, and I, I think there there may be a, just a touch of this sort of John Osborne-esque character in in Philip himself when you when you when you look at loneliness of long distance runner uh 
you know, the Tom Courtney character, he's he's running because he likes to run, but also there's this figure of the of the of the uh, head of the of the board or whatever that was, this institution who wants you know him to win for the for for the school, um, and and the character is very torn. Should I run just for myself or should I run for the? For the institution, this seems very close to the divided heart of, of Philip as well. I think that's absolutely true. And one thing that I think we really is well worth bringing up is that Philip is not an especially sympathetic character quite a bit of the time. The part was written specifically for Jerzy Stur. I think Kishilovsky knew that he needed an actor like Stur, who's, who's incredibly versatile. I mean, I love comparing him with the British actors Jim Broadbent and mm-hmm. Timothy Spall. And I do think the comparison stands up because all three of those actors can do everything from the most heart wrenching tragedy to the wild wildest comedy, uh, sometimes flipping from one to the other in the same scene. I mean, it's just a really uncanny ability. And I think the the, the unsympathetic traits in in um, in, in, in Philip, uh, I mean, for example, we, his, his wife, Irka, is clearly suffering from what we would now recognise as postpartum depression. Um, she was, there's a, again, more throwaway dialogue. She's told that um, she can't come back home um, because she's suffering from mastitis. In other words, she can't produce milk. And while Philip is banging on about what he wants to do with his new camera, she is lamenting the fact that she she's not being what she sees as a proper mother. And he's not paying attention to her in the way that she thinks um, he should be. And, 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 and he should be. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it is entirely appropriate to criticise him there um you know however however excited he is by his shiny new toy and he does neglect her um and there's a, i mean actually there's a really snobbish again another throwaway line where they're watching television and the the polish internationally famous polish pianist christian zimmerman and philip says um well that's um Ilka plays that and gestures to an accordion and the the implication is that the accordion is a sort of really inferior instrument compared to a sort of classical piano absolutely i think that's that's very true and there you can also see the this this cultural slash maybe even class aspiration that that philip has because uh, which is also represented by the character of anna vodarczyk the, the 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 tv reporter from warsaw who dresses in a very different way from irka you know irka has this more sort of homely provincial look uh, and uh, anna vodarczyk is this uh, let's say modern woman from uh, from the city uh, Yesterday I joked that had this been a you know Frank Capra movie, uh, Philip would have been played by Gary Cooper and she would have been played by Barbara Stanwyck. You know she has this urbane flair uh, about her, uh, but also you mentioned you know how just how sympathetic Philip really is in the screenplay that that we studied here at the Krzysztof Kieślowski Archive. It turns out that Philip was even less sympathetic in in that he he cheated on his wife actually with with Anna Wodarczyk and it's made very very explicit. Uh, his wife also at some point cheats on him, so that mar- marital betrayal is completely eradicated from the film. The, there was not, I don't I'm not sure about completely mm-hmm. because there is a scene towards the end where she says you last. I had sex with six months ago and I'm five months pregnant, which is a. Uh, I would need to check the numbers. If, I, I think she says. Five months or six? We we need to check it. Yeah. But in the screenplay, it's very clear that that she's pregnant by somebody else. And um, with regard to Anna, um, well, actually, there, there is a his Philip's body language when he's alone in a room with her for the first time is absolutely fascinating. He is he's sort of really sort of hunched up and withdrawn. He has no idea how to react to a woman like that. He clearly has no experience of that kind of woman. And you know, sort of really confident professional um you know someone who knows exactly what she wants and um and i believe she is the she is the one who kisses him yes in fact i think they're having a conversation and he's just revealed a few things about himself and he asks her a personal question and clearly he's going to try and um, try and get a similar degree of honesty out of her but instead of revealing anything about herself she leans forward and kisses him um presumably knowing perfectly well that that would distract him enough from prying too deeply because she doesn't presumably because he's a budding investigative journalist she doesn't want him to uh, delve too deeply into her life yes absolutely and i i just realized that you know there's it's a fantastic balance in this uh, portrayal of philip by stur uh, i think this movie would be would have been completely different with a different actor in it i mean it, it stur brings the exact you know uh, balance between the sweetness even some childlike quality i would say and this cunning because philip is a cunning character he does as vitek points out by the end he does work towards his goals and he really achieves those goals uh, also by, by being quite let's say pliable and and it, it's there uh, 
I just thought that, you know, had this been an angry young man, a British film, probably Malcolm McDowell could play him in the in the mode from Oh Lucky Man, you know, this sort of Candide almost like character. But we know, we saw in the opening credits that um, the screenplay is credited to Krzysztof Kieślowski, but also with some um, work uh, done uh, by Jerzy Sztur regarding the dialogue. And I don't know how accurate this credit is. Was it only the dialogue or was simply, you know, was Kieślowski simply trying to acknowledge just how deeply Sztur shaped uh, this character and by extension the film itself because it is a performance that makes the film in a way because uh, i mean as 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 we observed yesterday there are a lot of non-verbal moments yes. um which are not in the script um i mean that bit where behind the boss's back he gestures to he makes a sort of gesture a snipping gesture to and actually to basically says you know i wanted to include that footage of the film but he wouldn't let me um just little little throwaway moments like that um so i think it, yes it was probably very much an acknowledgement of how much uh, Stuart brought to the um brought to the role i should mention that they they'd worked together in i mean they worked together on in the scar and which um, still played a significant supporting role. And then they made a television feature called The Calm in 1976, which was the first feature-length part that um, Kieślowski wrote for Stur. And he's, he's, again, he's a, he's a man who he's just come out of prison um, and is trying to go straight and finds himself embroiled in a you know load of sort of complex, complex work, Machiavellian workplace politics. So and, you know, similar to Camera Buff in quite a few ways um, and, and, and a similar character in that he's not wholly sympathetic, but we do broadly understand where he's coming from. Um, now, the, the, the calm was not broadcast in 1976, I think because of there was sort of social unrest going on at the time and they didn't think it was appropriate and it wouldn't actually be shown until 1980 after camera buff came out um but 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 quite clearly they they loved working together and uh, and and uh, and of course Kishlovsky was having these qualms about uh, ethical qualms about documentary making and 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 Stuhl was in many ways the perfect actor to portray some uh, someone like that he's very good at suggesting sort of really complex internal dilemmas but in just very very brief brilliantly observed shorthand Yes, and I, I think that the thing that Kishlovsky recognized in Stur really testifies to Kishlovsky's moral imagination also, because Stur was stereotypically, uh, stereotypically cast as this slime, slimy, conniving character, most notably in Felix Falk's uh, Top Dog, Vojirei, where he was really like the ultimate scumbag, you know, this sort of uh, sneaking and, you know, uh, like, 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 like the, the, the ultimate toady, you know. Uh, his, his part in, in The Scar is... is 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 very very similar actually so yes that could that was clearly the route he could have gone down if you know, people had been less uh, sympathetic to what else he could do um, exactly and Kieślowski discovered something more gentle you know i i think something childlike um, uh, i i think it's it's a major piece of acting also because his whole body is uh, is in the character you know i i think you know the brilliant absolutely brilliant uh, actors think that he does uh, just holding the camera you know the the way that philip clings to this camera you know sort of he 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 attaches it himself to, to to the camera he hunches you know over it it really becomes an extension of himself he's just just holding the camera you can see the ho the whole body tensing up around this device and, and this i think is is really great acting oh absolutely and it's it, you know he's finally he, he's his whole body is acknowledging he's found a purpose in life and as i said the film does not dwell on the fact that he's an orphan it's a completely throwaway piece of dialogue but of course he's grown up without a family um and of course orphans do have to learn how to think on their feet and be, be streetwise to a certain extent often without necessarily realizing the sort of wider things going on about it and that's why he's so obsessed with the notion of settling down and starting a family and then when, when of course the daughter comes along he says right that's it we've we started a family that's it i'm happy um you know i'm not really going to pay much attention to what my wife's thinking <laughs> it's, it's, it's the, you know he's he's got that particular fantasy now he's moving on to his other fantasy of a, of becoming a filmmaker and he can, the two can't coexist and tellingly when he says uh, when he asks his wife uh, what do you want and she says i want exactly the thing that you always said you wanted she says some calm uh, again and that brings us to the title of the film that you mentioned calm spokoi is the this sort of unattainable goal for for the character of Spokui? He just wants to live this sort of quiet, simple life, and yet Philip has that life at the beginning. Mm. That's one of the wonderful things about the screenplay. He says at the beginning of the film, "I have everything I ever wanted," and yet in the film he discovers a new need. He discovers a new drive. Yesterday I revisited this. 
1972 film by Kieślowski called Between Wrocław and Zielona Góra. It's probably one of the two least seen Kieślowski films ever. He do, do, did those two films on, on commission in the early 70s, which are, let's say, industrial films. Uh, this one uh, particularly uh, is a 10-minute infomercial <laughs> on this new and growing industrial town in the um, south of Poland, uh, which shows, you know, just how many job opportunities are there, uh, community housing, and, you know, it, it, it portrays this possibility for for a happy and calm family life for young people of Poland at that time. And I just realized, and I, I didn't think about it until today, that this film, 1972, and uh, Amator really bookend the whole Gerek era, the, the Edward Gierek era in Poland. Edward Gierek was the um, first secretary of the Communist Party in the 1970s, and he brought with himself this seeming prosperity and also this technocratic flair, which uh, seemed pragmatic, very community-oriented. And I just realized that probably the director character is a little bit of a commentary in Kamerabaf. On, on Gierek himself and on the style of management, saying, oh, you know, not everything is perfect, but we can achieve stuff if we only agree mutually that we can. The famous exchange between Gierek and uh, his uh, audience was, uh, will you help, comrades? And the audience was saying, yes, we will help. We will do it together. So possibly towards the end of the decade, Kishlovsky is showing this character and saying, you know, should we still trust him or should we maybe distrust him from this point on? Well, I, th I mean, this is, the, 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 I, I hadn't given that possibility any thought until you raised it just now, but I think you're absolutely right. I think yeah, very, very much is. Um, I mean, the, 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 the famous, if, certainly for people outside Poland, the, the legend of Gierek is that he's the man who maxed out Poland's credit card in order to try and uh, sort of buy their way into becoming a sort of successful western oriented uh, democracy. And of course, it, it, it collapsed as uh, such plans were inevitably going to do. And also, he was um, famous for pumping money into industries that were simply not salvageable, um, presumably, again, in a way to make sure that the communities that um, were based around those industries wouldn't collapse. So there's, you know, you get sort of multiple... Uh, as, as with the the director in the in the film, he, he's he's sort of trying to deal with multiple, often conflicting and contradictory um, impulses. And yes, I think that is that is very 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 true. And it's something that Kishlovsky would would clearly have been have been interested in. And of course, uh, two years later, after after the premiere of of Kamerbaf, uh, martial law happened, and you know, in between we had the solidarity outbursts. We may discuss this at the very end. I I just want to quote one historical fact, actually two, uh, that uh, I, I take from Małgorzata Hendrykowska's book, uh, Indispensable, a uh, chronicle of Polish film. Uh, she begins each year by uh, synopsizing the year, the most important events of the year. And uh, in 1979, two notable events. Uh, there was the, the first uh, pilgrimage of John Paul II to Poland. Uh, he did m meet Edward Gierek in uh, June of that year uh, at the Belvedere. Um, uh, almost 10 million Poles greeted uh, John Paul II on, on his way, which was clearly both a religious and a political <laughs> act. And uh, in, at the end of October 1979, so right at the time when uh, Kieślowski was winning the then Gdańsk Film Festival, uh, winning the Golden Lions, uh, actually Poland took another enormous loan from the United States, $500 million. Uh, the Gierek government uh, basically borrowed from, from the US. Quite a paradox. The communist state is, is you know, uh, indebting itself in the capitalist state to, you know, to raise the, the level of living. And, uh, and, you know, this is pretty much a move, I think, that the director in the film would would make as well. An interesting fact, those debts are still not fully paid by Polish state. So we are speaking in 2023. Uh, well, I, I think we paid our war debts to the United States. Um, I mean, we, we have paid them off, but I think it was quite startlingly recently. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh, is there anything in the film, anything else, like small details that maybe you just noticed uh, um, uh, yesterday when we were watching the film or just film things that you feel uh, strongly that we should mention? Uh, what about the films themselves that Philip makes? Do you... Uh, How how do you look at his sort of progression as a filmmaker within the story? Because that's also an important character arc. Yes, particularly as the films are constantly being analysed and, and criticised. And uh, um, I mean, yeah, he's clearly. I mean, the 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 Jubilee one, we don't really see that much of it. Um, and I mean, what we focus on is the bits that he's the. the controversial bits the it's cutaway shot of the pigeons which he he did just because he liked it i mean if i think it was um andre yurga says you know how well no actually no, no it's the man sitting next to him at the award presentation you know how how incredible you you film things just because they're there and you like them <laughs> you know the level of freedom you just can't can't most filmmakers can't imagine um and then but the the film about the um his his colleague is 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 clearly a much more polished piece of work with, uh, um, you know, with a, with a commentary recorded by the colleague. So it's it's not it's, it's not imposing a um, directly imposing anyway a particular authorial perspective. Although obviously that is <laughs> the, the nature of the, the the nature of film. But it looks like a, a, a much more um, much more professional polished documentary. Clearly one considered good enough to show on television. And and the the, the I mean the other film the one about the uh, um, the alleged um, sort of mismanagement of the construction of the, of the town is, is sort of shaping up to be a more sophisticated piece of filmmaking still. But, um, but of course, that one gets uh, abruptly cancelled. Uh, but he is clearly growing as a filmmaker in terms of his understanding of how... Um, I mean, the, the, the film, we're, we're constantly seeing him learning about the principles of filmmaking. And there's a bit where he's editing things and he discovers you can sort of cut things together and create certain effects and it's the thing that all filmmakers um understand when they learn on the job and it's, it's lovely actually seeing him learn on the job from his, his very very first film um and what, well, actually i should say one thing about kishlovsky is that we're in the very unusual position of having access to every single one of his films right from his very 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 first student film a completely silent student effort called uh, a tramway and normally with filmmakers we don't get to see their film school yes. shorts in fact this is, this is where poland is is fairly unusual in, in that uh the filmmakers short films are often are available <laughs> that's really the credit to um, the film school in which that pre preserves all those films but also we are lucky uh, here at the kishlovsky archive to have access even to the unproduced scripts and there are many of those actually there are plans to um, translate the whole um, kishlovsky papers to english and hopefully the researchers of tomorrow will have uh, fantastic opportunities to also study uh, study uh, those um, one last question I am thinking of the participation of Krzysztof Zanussi in the film you, you mentioned yourself that when you watched the film for the first time you didn't know the context of, of Camouflage Camouflage is a film made in 1976 uh, so a little bit earlier um, which has a story of its own so we won't <laughs> go into much detail now but uh, Let's at least at least touch upon it. Why camouflage? Why Zanussi, who makes a cameo in the film? He actually no, it's more than a cameo. It's a speaking part, uh, and he plays uh, himself. How do you see this sort of dialogue between Kishlovsky and Zanussi in this film? Well, we should probably mention that Zanussi was in fact Kishlovsky's boss at the time. <laughs> he, he ran the tour film unit, um, so yes, Kishlovsky would have been very very well aware of camouflage, presumably during production as well. Camouflage is a is a wonderful film. I really strongly recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to track it down. It's uh, um, and not it's it's a wonderful film because it deals with such universal subjects. It was seen as being. Uh, it was inevitably interpreted as being critical of the way things worked in, in communist Poland, but actually, it's um, anyone who has worked for a large institution, as I have, will will have dealt with exactly the same kind of Machiavellian internal politics that the film is entirely about. Um, I mean, the, the film's main focus is about a, an older, much more experienced man, played by the wonderful Zbigniew Zapasiewicz, um, who is basically teaching his younger colleague. I'm, I'm afraid I've forgotten the the actor. Uh, uh, Piotr Garlitsky. Uh, uh, yeah, Piotr Garlitsky. Um, Basically, teaching him how to um, how to be, how to just manipulate things to his advantage. And the Galitsky character is horrified by this because he he just wants to be sort of honest and idealistic. And um, I think it's worth noting in Blind Chance, um, Zapasiewicz plays a fairly significant supporting role. He's the um, there are there are two there are two communist representatives of the Communist Party that the um, protagonist Bogusław Linda runs into. One is the good communist, the idealistic communist, played by Tadeusz Womnicki. The other is the Machiavellian communist played by Zbigniew Zapasiewicz that performance 
and the whole look of the character and the behaviour and the body language is absolutely identical to the character that he played in Camouflage. That cannot be a coincidence. I'm sure that Kishlovsky asked him point blank to repeat that performance. Um, and it's wonderfully effective if you've seen Camouflage. <laughs> um, and of course, yes, yeah, so obviously when I saw the film the first time, the, the quotation from Camouflage meant nothing to me. And I knew that Zanussi was a fellow filmmaker, but I hadn't seen any of his films. But it's a very, it's very interesting, actually. I don't think I've... Uh, Where you, you actually have a filmmaker inviting a more senior more internationally recognized filmmaker to make a cameo as himself discussing his own filmmaking philosophy in what appears because you said this stuff isn't in the script in what appears to have been a genuine q a session um it's uh, no it's really it's really very striking indeed because i can't think of an equivalent mm -hmm. in any other film but steven spielberg asking david lynch to play john ford <laughs> maybe in the fa fable ones but it's it's a different it's a different uh thing uh, yeah we, we looked at the screenplay and it turns out that zanussi in the screenplay uh, th there's this note when he meets the uh, factory director uh, there, there's this short note Zanussi is very happy about this encounter in the film it's very clear that he's not happy about the encounter he he keeps his hands crossed he says uh, blatantly to the director that he doesn't have time for a coffee in the film in the script actually they they do walk away and they do have a coffee together so I think that particular change may signal that you know Zanussi is and, and, and both as a character as a real director but also Kishlovsky as the filmmaker behind Amator that they are distancing themselves from the from the from the um the power figure however we uh, discovered yesterday that um, the english translation of the subtitles on the, on the blu-ray of um, the camera above doesn't quite precisely render what Zanussi is saying in this q a session because he effectively in polish he says something like no he says exactly we film directors are no longer engineers of the human souls which is uh, rendered in the subtitles we are no longer alchemists but as we discovered engineers of human souls it's quite a particular specific phrase isn't it it is it's 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 um basically it was it was uttered by one of stalin's underlings who to to stalin himself and he liked the phrase so much that he he quoted it and um, um yes i mean his, his, the, the the attitude was that people who work in the arts in culture are, are the engineers of human souls as opposed to the engineers of uh, you know sort of more conventional engineering projects um and it, it also became the title of a novel by um josef Skrodetsky, where uh, its use was uh, i think quite deliberately ironic Right, so basically, and this, I think we, we can slowly end on this note, it seems that Camera Buff is in deep conversation, very layered, with the whole tradition of um, socialist realist filmmaking, uh, filmmaking that uh, really took over in 1950s in Poland, in the Stalinist era, where filmmakers were supposed to present the world and the state and workers and as more as they should be than they, are, than they actually were. And uh, Philip begins as a sort of a social Israelist filmmaker when he gets a commission from his uh, director, but then he becomes something else entirely. Um, in the script, at the very end, he decides to become a TV reporter, just like Jurga, and he uh, sees uh, the opening image, which in the script is the hawk uh, clawing away at, at the chicken. He, as he is walking uh, towards the TV building, he sees some fake chickens, uh, like props, being prepared for some film production. And he sees the hawk swooping down and snatching one of the fake chickens. It strikes me as quite a pretentious idea, you know, to have this sort of fake chicken as the echo. So it's very good that Kishlovsky scrapped that. But uh, how do you f read this? opening metaphor the hawk is actually you know preying upon chicken because it's the opening image of the movie it's quite important it's not just the opening image of the movie but it's also explicitly referred to when Irka has a nightmare about a hawk attacking some, some chicken so it's a um yeah i mean you know clearly philip philip is philip is the chicken and the hawks are the various people sort of interfering in his work but also i mean philip is sort of trying to become the the hawk mm. but isn't really um equipped to do it he doesn't really understand how to play the the, the, sort of the necessary games that uh, all the various other characters like Anna Rodacci in particular know how to know how to play so he's, he's he remains an innocent right up to right up to the end and you know therefore ripe for being uh, you know, the hawk swooping down on him and carrying him off 
And uh, in the conversation on the hill, um, the di director says to Philip, oh, your films are so sad. You only show the sad, drab side of life. Uh, why don't you show this? And he, you know, present this vista, sort of this, this rural Polish life. And Philip says something to the effect of uh, only nature can be made public because nature is sort of neutral, right? So I think that may hark back to this opening image as well, that, you know, showing of a hawk, you know, clawing at its victim, it's, it's a new, it, it may be a neutral act, but, but it becomes political within the context of the film. I should point this out because I, I worked on the, uh, the Blu-ray release of Camera Buff in the UK. And of course, as soon as I saw that shot, we have very, very strict animal cruelty laws in Britain. And in, as soon as I see a shot like that, I think, oh God, is that going to be censored? Um, because it's a, it's a law passed in 1937, which is still on the statute books to this day, which was passed because of outcry about horses being tripped in Westerns. And it basically... If if there's genuine animal cruelty that was carried out specifically for the film, it has to be cut. And it doesn't matter whether it's a piece of, you know, the Italian cannibal exploitation film or Tarkovsky's Andrei Rublev. There, there is no d contextual distinction. What do, the, the loopholes are, if the cruelty was faked, and that can be proven, or if the cruelty would have happened anyway. And quite clearly, um, the in this case, we're talking about the cruelty would have happened anyway. This is right. nature read into the glory. Hawks do swoop down and, and carry off chickens. It's just, you know, if the camera happens to be, you know, the, the camera happens to be there, fine, otherwise, but it would have happened regardless of the camera's presence. And therefore, you know, pure nature, completely unmediated by the filmmaker. But that's a perfect ending to our conversation because it, it does uh, remind us that we are dealing constantly Constantly, as, as filmmakers, as video editors, as, with various forms of censorship, and they are not always sinister. You know, as, as you mentioned, there, there there may be you know a censorious voice censoring, for example, animal cruelty as well. So, so this idea of Philip just discovering that there's always some censorious gaze. His wife, you know, covering their daughter, not to be from naked, or the boss. Or, or, or the TV editor, Jurga, or anyone. A filmmaker always has to think about uh, his or her audience and, and uh, what, what, what powers there be that will interfere or not uh, in the film. And I would just uh, uh, say one anecdote that I listened to yesterday because we are in Sokolovsko and I was listening to Irena Strzałkowska, who worked closely with Kieślowski, especially in the 80s. She, she was instrumental as um, a member of the TOR a film unit in bringing Kieślowski's films to international audiences, mainly to Cannes. And she mentioned that when uh, Przypadek, Blind Chance, was shown at the Cannes Certain Regard in 1987 as an opening film of that section, uh, um, Cannes Film Festival actually requested that Kieślowski cut one line of dialogue in the film, which referred to uh, some historical Polish event that the festival felt that the, the audience wouldn't know what, what the character is, is talking about. So Kieślowski did cut the one line. And at the opening screening of the film, Somebody asked uh, from the audience, uh, Mr. Kishlovsky, as a Polish filmmaker, do you need to um, cope with censorship? Um, and Kishlovsky's answer was brilliant. He says, uh, which censorship do you mean? There are many. There's Polish censor, and I know how to deal with them because uh, this is my work. But there's also censorship here at the festival. They asked me to cut this one line. So which censorship actually do you make uh, mean? And I think that also reflects just how complex uh, Kieślowski's thinking on the issue of being a filmmaker uh, was. Yes, I mean, this is one of the the, great, the incredible things about Kieślowski. I mean, I've, I have said um, more than once that he's not just a great filmmaker. He is one of the late 20th century's great moral philosophers. And I think we, and he just happens to use film as a medium. Uh, he, in fact, he famously said, someone once asked, why do you make films? And he, he said, because I don't know how to do anything else, which is, is you know, wonderfully self-deprecating. But, uh, but, but no, I think, he, I think he is one of the, one of the great thinkers of the last, uh, the last half century. And the film is about to turn 45 itself. So, and here we are in 2023, still pondering the meanings of, of Camera Buff, of Amator, and of uh, really Krzysztof Kieślowski's whole uh, body of work. And uh, this is the place also to thank both the Sokołowsko and the In Situ Foundation and the Polish Cultural Institute in New York, uh, who made uh, this. Uh, residence and this conversation possible. So thank you so much and thank you Michael so much for coming and for discussing this film uh, with me. It, it, it really seems like 
we only scratched the surface and we could go on and on and on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I have really, really enjoyed this. And I totally, because I, I, when we started discussing this this project and this conversation, I was wondering, well, why do I actually need to come to Sokolovsko when we're communicating perfectly well through email and Zoom or whatever? But now that I'm actually physically here, um, it absolutely makes sense. It's, it's an extraordinary environment. And uh, um, thank you so much for thinking of me and inviting me. Thank you so much.